everybody and welcome. It's really a pleasure to have all of you here with us at this special conference honoring Ned Gramlich and the importance of policy research. I'm Susan Collins. I'm the Dean of the Gerald R. Ford School of Public Policy at the University of Michigan and this is a really special event for us. Before I go any further though, I do want to give a very warm welcome to Ruth Gramlick, who is Ned Gramlick's wife and a number of members of their family. Ruth, it's wonderful to have you here and Rob and others as well, um, especially because this is another important day for them as well. Ruth and Ned's granddaughter, Rachel, is graduating from high school and I understand she'll be joining us for part of the lunch. So a special day for them and we're particularly pleased that they are spending part of it with us today. Um, well, today's conference honors two centennials. As many here in the room may know, it was 100 years ago this year that the 12 Federal Reserve Banks first opened for business. And it was 100 years ago as well that the first policy program at the University of Michigan was launched. Of course, it was known by a different name in 1914. Um, it was a program that was started as part of the university's political science department. It expanded over time. It evolved as an institute and finally in 1995 a school. In 1999 we were named for President Ford. Well Ned Gramlich played key roles in both of those institutions. As you'll hear he was here as a governor at the Fed for five years and he was truly a founding integral part. He was one of the founding fathers of the Ford School. He was a driving force behind the university's decision to make us a school with the ability to grant tenure and to take our place among the outstanding professional schools on University of Michigan's campus. And he was in fact our very first dean. So how better to celebrate the importance of research for good policy as we recognize both the great policy school and also one of the most important policy institutions in the world than a conference in honor of Ned Gramlich. In a minute, our conference organizers, Paul Courant and Dan Kovitz, will tell you more about his remarkable legacy. I would simply like to say at this point that for 100 years, the Ford School has produced many policy leaders and many faculty who we remember fondly and of whom we are truly proud, but really none has been more accomplished, had a greater impact, or been more beloved than Ned Gramlich. I'd like to thank the Federal Reserve for their work and their assistance with today's conference. Dan Kovitz and his colleagues have really been behind this idea 100% and have been a great joint partner in putting this together. And that's really a testament to Ned's ability to link together his students, his academic colleagues, and policy practitioners. Um, I'd also like to thank Adarsh and Ranveer Trehan for their generous support, which helped to make this conference possible. Today's event is attended and viewed online by many, many of Ned Gramlich's friends, his colleagues, his former students, and I'd like to thank all of you, whether here in the room or watching us online or being streamed, uh, for joining us today. And with that, it is my pleasure to turn things over to our conference organizers, Paul Courant, who was the Harold T. Shapiro Professor of Public Policy and Economics, and Dan Kovitz, who is Associate Director of the Federal Reserve's Division of Research and Statistics. Paul and Dan. Thank you, Susan. 
Um, thank you all for being here. It's really a great pleasure to uh, be able to honor Ned Gramlich and his work, much of which was done here. I'm at the Federal Reserve Board and, of course, much at the University of Michigan, which are the two institutions that we, um, we represent. I also have to say, in a lifetime of co-authoring with people with the letter C, right, um, uh, I'm C-O-U, he's C-O-V, so he goes second is the... Uh, um, <laughs> So we've had a tremendously good time putting this symposium together, calling on old friends and colleagues of Ned's and some younger folks who may have known Ned less well but whose work was shaped by him, uh, either directly or via the simple fact that it's really hard to find any important topics in policy economics that Ned didn't work on. The old friends were especially gratifying. All of us, almost all of us in this room have put together conferences over the years. And of course, the people you want to have as participants are busy and hard to get. In this case, all we had to do was say the magic words, Ned Gramlich. And everyone we asked who did not have a pre-existing plan to be hundreds, at least hundreds, in some cases thousands of miles away, said, of course, thank you for asking. That would be great. When is it? I'll be there. And frequently, they'd say, there's no way I could turn down something that would honor and celebrate Ned. Many of the people in this room can speak to both the joys of being Ned, Ned's colleague and his friend. Ned and I wrote something like 10 papers together, as well as a book on budget deficits that unfortunately nobody read. Um, uh, um, we, uh, unfortunate because we didn't get any royalties, and even more unfortunate because if they'd read it, things would be in much better shape. Um, so we like to believe. So we, we also went to dozens of baseball games, argued over the definitions of many crossword puzzles, uh, went to basketball games. Ned always played, played basketball together. Ned always won. That's obvious. Um, and played tennis together. Um, and sometimes I won that. That was better. Um, he was fun to work with, and he was fun to play with. And although he was always serious about his work, and for that matter, serious about his play, no one flat out enjoyed the work as much as Ned. As you can see from the topics that we will be discussing today, <clears throat> Ned had great taste in problems. Issues that he worked on 40 years ago and more are still generating interesting arguments. And among the many reasons for mourning his untimely death is that although he would have been frequently angry and frustrated, who isn't, by the political economy of the past seven years or so, he also would have really enjoyed being part of it, talking about it, writing about it, uh, even finding humor in it, and it would have been a pleasure to share that experience with Ned. Importantly, there is much, there is more that we left out than we were able to fit into a one-day symposium. Among other things that we aren't discussing today, Ned worked on poverty, income distribution, well, she did poverty we will mention, income distribution generally, public employment, minimum wages, school finance, tax limitation, the demand for public services, baseball compensation schemes, and the fiscal systems of several other countries. He was also an institution builder, as Susan pointed out. He was the founding dean of the Ford School, uh, an engaged member of the Board of Governors, interim provost of the University of Michigan, acting director of the CBO. In all of these settings, he tinkered and conjoled and designed systems that made things work better. And, that's, and that continues to serve us today. And known to many of you, but not all, he was a great teacher. <clears throat> Again, both serious and playful. His students talk about him in much the same way that his colleagues do. He was fun to work with. He helped to make the work interesting in no smart, small part because he found it so interesting. And of course, there isn't a great deal in the world of public policy that tickles the, there is a great deal in the world of public policy that tickles the funny bone. Um, uh, and that fact was not lost on Ned. Um, this conference has pulled together, uh, was pulled together to celebrate Ned and the importance of policy research. And our method, of course, is to bring together leading policy researchers of our time to talk about the issues of the day that are related to Ned's work. Ned was an exponent of positive economic analysis who was motivated by scientific considerations, how do things work, but even more by normative considerations, how can we make the world better? He loved economics, and he loved thinking like an economist about pretty, and about pretty much everything. All of this leads to what might be termed the Gramlich's, Gramlich's theorem on policy economics, which is as follows. I don't have a slide, so you'll have to pay attention. <clears throat> One, there are interesting problems out there, problems that matter for human well-being. Two, the intelligent application of economics to many of these problems, perhaps all of them, will yield understanding and provide direction for policy. Three, therefore, it is our ethical duty 
to use economic methods to do policy analysis and to do it well and honestly, the way Gramlich would do it, and then apply it to the policy arena. That's a little too serious because we have to add that it's also our duty to have fun along the way. Again, following Ned's example. And now it's my pleasure to introduce my colleague, Dan Kovitz, to say a few more words. Thank you, Paul. On behalf of the Federal Reserve, I would very much like to welcome all of you to what promises to be a very interesting and meaningful day. Like Paul, it has been a pleasure for me to help put together this symposium. I have known Ned's family for many years, and I had the privilege to work closely with Ned on a loan guarantee board when he served as a governor here at the Fed, his second tour of duty, the first being a stint early in his career as a Fed economist. As governor, Ned engaged effectively in the monetary policy process, but was also deeply committed to issues relating to consumer affairs and community development. As Paul mentioned, finding enough topics and participants for the program was not difficult at all, given the breadth of, breadth of Ned's work and his connections to so many involved in economic research and the implementation of economic policy. However, some topics had to be left off the program, um, including some that Paul already mentioned, uh, and my personal favorite, federal loan guarantee programs. <laughs> Ned was on several guarantee boards, loan guarantee boards, some of which he chaired, and he also gave a speech on the economics of federal loan guarantee programs. So while all of Ned's work will not be on, not be discussed today, the topics we chose are among the most important issues in policy that Ned worked on during his career. Our hope is that the sessions generate lively and in the spirit of Paul's addendum to the Gramlich theorem, fun discussions. Before we begin, however, I'd like to thank the Ford School for co-sponsoring the conference, as well as a colleague of mine in the research divi division, Rodney Ramsharan, for helping us to think through which areas of Ned's prolific career to highlight in the conference. I would also like to thank staff both here and at the University of Michigan for their substantial support. And finally, I'd like to add that we are especially pleased that the Gramlichs all of the Gramlicks, Ruth, Rob, Mary, Rachel, Sammy, Kate, Jack, and Jake, um, are all joining us for various uh, portions of, of today's program. So with that said, uh, let's get started with the celebration of Ned, his work, and the role that economic thinking and research can play in shaping good policy. Paul, Paul will introduce our first moderator. So the first session will be moderated by uh, Marina Whitman, uh, Ned's colleague and mine. Um, um, there's information in the large program sheet about, um, about Marina's career, which, like Ned's, is too long to recount. Um, uh, and she'll introduce her panel. Um, so you have a brief biography of her, as I said. Um, I'll just say that in addition to a distinguished academic career, very distinguished, because many of us were required to read papers of hers when we were in graduate school. Um, um, she's also been a member of the Council of Economic Advisors and a vice president of General Motors. And Marina, the show is yours. Thank you, Paul and Dan. I can't tell you what an honor and privilege it is to be part of this event, even though our substantive fields, Ned's and mine, didn't particularly overlap. But Paul graciously found something for me to do. Um, <laughs> I um, came, Ned and I got to know each other fairly late in life, quite late in mine and moderately late in his. But it didn't take any time at all for me to become part of the legion of Ned Gramlich fans and loyalists. Uh, the um, biographies of our speakers 
are in your program, each of them is a titled professor or researcher at the various institutions they're at. So I won't repeat that information, except to say that I believe one piece of it is already wrong. That is Shell Danziger, uh, who is president of the Russell Sage Foundation, has, is listed as being on leave as a distinguished university professor at the University of Michigan. I believe that Sheldon has now cut that cord, is that correct, and S retired? December 31st. December 31st, okay. We already had his retirement party, which misled me. But uh, while uh, we will continue to admire um, <coughs> his work from afar, we do not realistically expect him back full time. Uh, and um, it's hard to believe this, but, um, <clears throat> Sheldon has said that in the 12 minutes he's allotted, and by the way, I have uh, time cards here, which I will utilize if necessary. Uh, he intends to talk about the link between fiscal policy solutions and the inequality debate, um, the trade-off in income tax reform between um, <clears throat> promoting preserving saving and investment and, pre and preserving uh, distributional neutrality, and also some thoughts on broader tax reforms that is going beyond the income tax. So uh, without further ado, Sheldon. Uh, there you go. Somebody looks great. Thank you. Actually, uh, Marina, I think you read somebody else's blurb. I don't oh, know anything no. about savings, but that's okay. Oh, I <laughs> that. yes, but that's fine. It's uh, all the fault of the internet. It says up here, Sheldon and, and I think, I'm afraid, I read Bill Gales, which I guess means that I won't have to read Bill Gales again. <laughs> So um, I, I, I'm uh, honored to be able to uh, speak at a conference that uh, commemorates uh, Ned's contributions to policy research. And uh, one of the things I did, uh, which was a true pleasure, was to uh, go back and uh, Google Ned. One of the things Paul said, it's remarkable how many papers uh, and books were widely read, but I picked out a few uh, in my area on uh, poverty and inequality, and um, uh, just from reading a few papers, you get uh, Ned's uh, deep interest in applying economics to um, uh, real-world problems. He wrote about the minimum wage uh, and the distributional effects of uh, the minimum wage versus the disemployment effects in a 1970-something uh, Brookings paper. He wrote about the distributional effects of unemployment after the recession of the 70s and focused on uh, the extent to which unemployment and other transfers were cushioning the uh, earnings losses differently for uh, higher income or lower income workers. And uh, he wrote uh, about the welfare system. So I start with uh, a few quotes and, and uh, it, it would, it, I guess we'll have to speculate whether uh, the recent trends, which I would say are worse than they were when, when Ned was writing, uh, would have made Ned less of an optimist, but I, I don't think so. Uh, but, um, I, I, I focus on this because um, um, it's it certainly, uh, it's the kind of thing I've said recently and then I went back and, and saw it with the Neds in the 60s and I would say the 70s when I started, there was a view that policy should be far-sighted toward the future and generous toward those of low incomes. And I know Gene Sterling's gonna talk about that today. Uh, today it is harder to make all arguments. I personally feel we've uh, replaced too much optimism with too much skepticism. Um, 
this is not the only domain of life where we are sadder but wiser, we still push on. And I think that's important for those of us who um, think uh, we've had policy solutions, whether it's the deficit book that Paul and Ned wrote or uh, policies, uh, uh, anti-poverty policies uh, that uh, don't get much traction. Um, so more uh, closer to uh, the topics that I've been involved in, uh, two selections of Ned's research on the safety net. Um, this is very relevant. There are some people who argue that uh, unemployment insurance caused the uh, Great Recession to be as long as in deep it as it was. Um, certainly, I think Ned wouldn't agree with that. Uh, but again, this notion of uh, focusing both on the disincentive effects and the distributional effects uh, come through this. And then I found a paper um, which um, I didn't remember, uh, and then I printed it uh, from Google and found out that it was actually in a book that Peter Gottschalk and I edited. Um, <laughs> But uh, after I read it, I thought, that was a really good paper. I'm glad we asked Ned uh, and his colleagues to write it. But again, this is really, this is 1993, and as I'll suggest, uh, unfortunately, things are a, a lot worse, largely because of the decline in the relative importance of transfers, the increase in the share of transfers received by high-income elderly persons, the rising importance of Social Security taxes, tax and transfer policies worsened. Uh, this disparity by a notable amount, and he was talking about growing inequality between uh, uh, the late 70s and the late 80s. Um, so let me briefly talk about um, uh, the poverty issue, which um, I think most people are aware. This is the 50th anniversary of the uh, war on poverty, and um, at least uh, some people uh, say, well, the war on poverty must be a failure because poverty remains high uh, and spending is high, uh, therefore uh, spending um, um, is ineffective. And um, if there's anything uh, we at the Ford School and Ned when he was teaching uh, would have emphasized, it's that uh, correlation is not causation. And indeed, uh, I've argued in uh, work over a long period that uh, the uh, rising transfers were needed just to keep poverty from rising even further. Uh, and so uh, you need to think about the counterfactual, certainly something that uh, Ned tried to teach our students. And so in my view, poverty is high because we went from this uh, golden age uh, when it really was the case that a rising tide lifts all boats, that economic growth was trickling down uh, to the poor, the middle class, and high income uh, workers. Uh, and um, uh, during this period, uh, poverty fell rapidly and inequality fell uh, slightly. Uh, but that since the early 70s, we've lived in this gilded age of rising inequality. And obviously, the quote from Ned in the early 90s was sort of at a period when some people were arguing, well, the increase in inequality we've seen is a temporary phenomenon. It'll, uh, it'll be self-correcting. 20 years later, it's obviously uh, it's not. Uh, we're in a period where uh, inequality has increased uh, rapidly. And I'm just going to skip because of my time a very simple picture of what it means to say a rising tide lifts all boats is the slide on the left. That's roughly uh, inflation adjusted family income at various points in the income distribution. And all the bars are tall and they're pretty similar. If anything, uh, the 95th percentile was a little bit uh, uh, less, a uh, little bit less of an increase uh, than uh, the 60th percentile, and we have this much prettier step ladder uh, on the right, which is what we mean when we say a rising tide no longer lifts all boats, that uh, income gains were lowest, almost non-existent at the bottom uh, and higher at the top, but obviously a period in which uh, all the bars are lower uh, than they were uh, on the left. 
And um, so the argument, uh, uh, which I've made in greater detail uh, elsewhere, is that it's the failure of the economy, not the safety net, that uh, the poor would be uh, much worse off without the war on poverty, variety of causes that most economists uh, have um, in the early years were arguing which one is 15 percent, which one is 20 percent. But I think the uh, consensus is that um, all of these are important in various ways over this really remarkable 40-year period in which uh, the real earnings of full-time, full-year male workers uh, has hardly uh, has hardly changed. Um, I, I don't have time to uh, do the footnotes uh, about the details. Um, much the same about the counterfactual is said about the stimulus. So um, Alan Blinder has a book in which he um, argues, and there's a lot of research across the spectrum, Robert Hall, that basically the stimulus worked. It just wasn't uh, as big as it should have been in retrospect, but again, people are saying missing uh, uh, the counterfactual and focusing on correlation. Gee, we spent all this money on the stimulus. The unemployment rate is still high. Therefore, uh, the stimulus failed. Um, this is where we are now, and it's why I'm uh, grumpy and depressed, and <laughs> I wonder whether Ned could still be optimistic uh, unemployment is high uh, five years into the recovery. Uh, I don't see any prospects for real wage growth for less educated workers. We haven't had any for 40 years. Why, we should, why should we expect it now? Income and wealth inequalities are at high levels. Indeed, uh, wealth inequality, I think, has really increased more than income inequality since the Great Recession. Uh, there's this relentless, what I call deficit mania, that threatens uh, the safety net as we know it. Um, I'll just quickly jump to here. A few policy recommendations, and um, I uh, think, I'd like to think that Ned would agree that these are relevant given this 40-year period uh, of inequality uh, related to the quote uh, about uh, rising inequality of the 90s from his paper. Uh, there were changes in the food stamp and the unemployment insurance program and the stimulus that had expired. An example uh, was the, I guess it, it may be less important now, but uh, the coverage of COBRA health insurance for laid off workers. I don't know enough about how the ACA works no, to know whether they'll be able to quickly get subsidized on the exchange. Um, the probably most important thing that came out of the welfare reform experience and then the recession experience is that it's fairly clear that uh, we now have a safety net that uh, works primarily for low-income workers. If you're a low-income worker, you get subsidized by um, um, the EITC, but uh, the experience of the 20 years post-welfare reform is that there's a substantial group of people who are disconnected from work and welfare. Robert Moffat recently uh, wrote about this, and it was picked up in the Washington Post. And so if you really want to have a work-based safety net, which is what we have, what we're missing is the um, focus on providing a low-wage job of last resort by which people who can no longer get on welfare, the long-term unemployed who are uh, terminated from unemployment insurance, ex-offenders who virtually nobody wants to hire, uh, end up now in a safety net without the kind of minimum benefit that I think uh, Ned um, uh, uh, would have proposed. Expanding the EITC for childless low-wage workers and raising the minimum wage, I think, are less controversial. But I think all of these are consistent with uh, Ned's uh, analysis that uh, one can look at these issues. Uh, I'm going to stop now, and I know that uh, Bill and Jean will have something to say about uh, the revenue uh, needed uh, to pay for these program expansions. Thanks. <laughs>
<clears throat> Thanks, Sheldon. Since I've already told you what Bill Gale is going to talk about, um, I don't have to do that now. Let me just say then that um, you now know from my goof why I and many others really disliked those strings of messages that Gmail forces on us. Um, one tiny substantive point, I guess it's substantive, that uh, <clears throat> Sheldon's very last comment reminded me of is that a lot of the things that seem to be stuck at the federal level, uh, and the minimum wage is one of them, are being implemented, and this ranges over a wide range of policies, in various ways by various states. And the state of Michigan uh, is well on its way uh, it, to raising the, minim the minimum wage in the state of Michigan, I think, to 925 an hour. It's been passed by both houses, and the governor has said he signed it. He will sign it. So um, apparently the uh, apparently somewhat hopeless block on legislation at the federal level is proceeding at the state, so at sta certain states. So without further ado, I will uh, introduce Bill Gale, whose CV, distinguished CV you have here to talk about all the things that Shel I said Sheldon was going to talk about. I very cleverly named my talk the Gramlich presentation, so uh, there might be a few of those up there. All right. Uh, where are we going here? Okay. Great. Thanks. Uh, so uh, I was a little worried that I had just been scooped when I heard Marina's uh, description of Sheldon's talk, but then I thought no, maybe it's just a case of uh, brilliant minds thinking alike, and we we had the same we had the same thoughts. Uh, anyway, let me let me start by saying what an honor it is to be to be asked to speak here, uh, an event in honor of Ned. I was one of those people that Paul referred to who uh, eagerly accepted uh, uh, the opportunity to speak here. Ned was both a first-rate scholar and a truly nice guy. Uh, I find myself continuing to uh, stumble across his scholarly work in a, a whole variety of areas: income distribution, housing, low-income family. Uh, fiscal policy. Uh, I, I was kind of depressed to hear your story, Paul, about nobody reading your book on fiscal policy because I'm in the process of writing a book on fiscal policy. <laughs> and so, so uh, I, I'll, I'll, I can't say I promise that won't happen, but uh, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a useful lesson. But let, Ned is a classic example of a scholar doing interesting work uh, on important and durable issues. Uh, he's also a great example, we're emphasizing policy research here, he's a great example of, to me of someone who has the mind to do first-rate academic work but and chooses uh, to do that work in the policy arena. Uh, there's a lot of work in the world that is brilliantly conceived and utterly useless uh, in terms of thinking about the real world and Ned's work uh, does not fall in that latter category. Uh, on top of that, he was a truly kind and generous person. I probably did not know him as well as most people here, but I found him utterly gracious, uh, uh, entirely willing to take time to talk to people like me about ideas, to solicit ideas, to respond to feedbacks. And one of the joys of the profession uh, was working, is working with people uh, like him. So let me, uh, having said all that, uh, I hope I haven't set the bar too high for my own talk. Uh, but uh, I hope that the talk follows, sort of follows in the tradition of issues and substance that, that, uh, that Ned would think was a useful contribution. So I want to talk about three things, as, as Marina noted. Uh, the first is to highlight the relationship between inequality and the fiscal problem. And I'll say more of that in a second. In, in a second. The second is to highlight the relationship between inequality and promoting saving and tax reform. There's, I think there's a lot of confusion about this in the literature or in the policy world, and I think there's a very simple way to clarify and cut through the issues. And the third is to talk about ro the role of distributional effects 
and inequality in the analysis of particular taxes like carbon taxes or the VAT. And uh, the points are going to be remarkably simple. And uh, uh, so if you think that, that you're missing something, that I'm really saying something deeper, I promise you I'm not. <laughs> I'm, I'm making very simple points here. All right, so let's start with two facts. When we talk about the long-term fiscal uh, problem, the reason it's a concern is that uh, chronic debt is thought to drag down the economy. That is, if we could get the fiscal house in order, the reward would be stronger economic growth, a larger future economy, higher future standards of living, et cetera. That's, that's, uh, if that weren't the case, we probably wouldn't care at all about fiscal policy. So that's point one. Point two is if you look over the last 20 years, the distribution of growth has gone mainly to the high end of the income distribution. I put up two separate numbers here, two sets of numbers, one from Piketty Saez and one from CBO's estimates of market income. Uh, Sheldon had some stuff about uh, census money income, which would be uh, the CBO market income is a, is a, is a more general number uh, that includes things like health insurance that, that money income doesn't. And so Piketty and Saez and CBO agree on the distribution of income 20 years ago in the early 1990s. Uh, they get somewhat different, uh, quite different estimates for the share of income growth over the, sub over the subsequent 17 years. Piketty Saez have almost all of it going, or all of it going to the top 10 percent, 60 percent going to the top 1 percent. Uh, CBO has 31% uh, going to the top 1%, 28 to the next nine, and 42 to, to the bottom 90. Uh, what's interesting, uh, what I want to highlight in both of those is that the distribution of income, the, sorry, the share of income growth over, the, over that period has been disproportionately weighted uh, toward the high end. There are issues with both sets of numbers, and I, we can talk about them if you want, but I think as, as, a, as a stylized fact, you accept the fact that growth has been disproportionately weighted toward high-end people. Well, combine that with the first point, uh, and uh, if the main benefits of solving the fiscal problem are a stronger economy, and the main benefits of a stronger economy go to high-income households, okay, at the risk of oversimplifying, then, then the benefits of the fiscal solutions would accrue mainly to higher-income households, okay? Uh, and that has a number of implications. Uh, first, the, let me be clear here, the goal is not to downplay the importance of the fiscal uh, problem. I just wrote a paper called, uh, with Alan Auerbach called Forgotten But Not Gone about, about the fiscal problem. Uh, nor is it argue, to argue that the bottom 90 percent of the population shouldn't care about the fiscal solution, although you can see why they might not care if they're not going to benefit from, from the growth that that would occur. Rather, it's to emphasize that if these two facts persist, it has big implications for what the right, what the fair, what the just uh, fiscal solution is. That is, how much you place on low income, how much you place on middle income, how much you place on high income. Because there's two aspects of it. One, there's bearing the burden of the loss in government spending or the increase in taxes that somebody has to pay. And then there's, gener there's uh, obtaining the benefits of a stronger economy. So if most of the benefits, or if those benefits are going disproportionately to high-income households, then that suggests that a solution should be weighted uh, more toward high-income households than it otherwise would be. Uh, and this last point is, is uh, too technical, and I will, I will just skip it. I wanna, I'll, I will, I'd rather stay consistent with the fact that I'm saying simple points than add a complicated point. Okay, so that's point one. Point two is tax reform. Uh, everybody wants to either preserve distribution neutrality and tax reform or enhance or, or be progressive on the one hand, and everybody wants to encourage saving on the other hand. There's no tax reform that, that people advocate as anti-saving, okay? But pro-saving and pro-progressive uh, uh, tax reform turn out uh, – not to, I won't say they're impossible, but they are very difficult if you're trying to do it just in the income tax. And that's a function of the current distribution of income and the current distribution of income tax liabilities. But let me, let me talk you through this. So let's go through three prominent recent tax reform proposals, both Simpson, Romney, and uh, Representative Camp. Uh, in a lot of ways, they look the same, but it turns out that their distributional effects differ, and their distributional effects differ because they treat saving differently, and that's, that's the key. Uh, 
So if you look at the three proposals, uh, a lot of this is like a Sesame Street thing, and you know these ways are similar and these ways are different. Uh, they have basically the same top rate, although camp uh, surtax is a little higher. They all repeal the alternative minimum tax. They all do something to itemize deductions, basically cap them or, or restrict them. Uh, the top corporate rate is either 25 or 28. They all move to a territorial system, and uh, they're all basically revenue neutral. Bull Simpson actually raises more revenue than, than current policy would, but Camp is current policy, and, and Romney was very explicit he wanted to raise the same amount of revenue as current policy. So what are the differences? The differences are in two things, the distributional effects and the treatment of saving. Uh, uh, Bull Simpson was actually progressive relative to the existing system. Camp is neutral with an, with an asterisk. That's because there's some budget gimmicks. It's distributionally neutral over the first 10 years. After that, it looks like it's regressive. Uh, but, but, you know, this is Washington, and let's keep a sense of humor about it. And roughly speaking, <laughs> roughly speaking, it's, I'm willing to call it distributionally neutral. Uh, Romney's plan, uh, I estimate with a couple other people, would be regressive. That, it was, that is, it would have to raise taxes on the middle class if it did everything else that it wanted to do. And so the question that's come up over the years is, well, how did Camp do it? How did he come up with a distributionally revenue neutral, distributionally neutral revenue neutral reform that looks a lot like Romney's? Uh, how come his is distributionally neutral and Romney's is regressive? Uh, and the answer is the treatment of saving. And it listed a number of ways here. Romney, quote, wanted to promote, uh, unquote, saving, uh, which we interpreted as not increase the taxation of saving, and uh, Camp instead raises the taxation of saving massively. Uh, so Romney would repeal the estate tax, Camp would retain it, uh, Romney would keep capital gains at 15, Camp would raise it to 25, uh, Romney would repeal the high income surtaxes associated with the Health Care Reform Act, Camp would retain them, uh, Romney would not restrict 401k contributions or, or, or muni bond income, uh, Camp would in the in the the surtax, which is sort of a pseudo a, a, AMT, everything that Camp does, Bull Simpson does even more, and Bull Simpson would even tax unrealized capital gains of death, uh, which is which is actually a big money item. Uh, and it's these differences in the plans which generate the differences in distributional uh, considerations. And the reason that's a problem is that that we want a tax reform to be pro-saving. Uh, generally, people want to be distributionally neutral. Uh, and it turns out uh, that that's a very hard combination to come up with. Uh, currently, uh, given the existing distributionally neutral relative to the current system, which remember is more progressive uh, than it was in the Clinton era, because we kept the uh, the Bush tax cuts for low income people, but but not the top rates, uh, and the income distribution has become more skewed. So it's it's just it's much harder to do tax reform now uh, because of the changing progressivity of the system and the changing distribution of income. So something's got to give in tax reform proposals. All right, the last point is just uh, about uh, specific taxes. Uh, I personally am a huge fan of a carbon tax. Um, uh, every time a report comes out, I remind the talking about which part of Antarctica is about to fall, or the, the, which part of the ice on Antarctica is about to fall into the water. I remind myself of that. I think there's also a fairly strong case for a VAT. It's more nuanced and it depends on other factors. But uh, I want to make a, I want to link these things to inequality in the few minutes I have left. Uh, the standard objection to both of these is that they're regressive. Larry Summers has a famous quote about the VAT. Uh, uh, the carbon tax is also regressive. My point is that it's a totally valid point. It should not get in the way of implementing these taxes, even if you care about distribution and regressivity. And there's two reasons. One is there are ways to, to design offsets to these taxes. We should basically first figure out what the best tax is, and then if we want to offset those effects, that's fine. And second is what we care about is the distribution or the regressivity of the entire system, not of particular components of it. And if there happen to be particular components that are good for other reasons, we should do them and then deal with the systemic effects as part of, as part of the overall system. So uh, this is swiped from a paper from my colleague Adele Morris. Uh, it basically indicates the regressivity of a carbon tax uh, by income decile. Uh, the f it, I think the, the vertical axis is carbon taxes as a share of income. So 
more is worse and low income households are worse. This is from a paper by Eric Toder and others uh, at the Tax Policy Center on the value added tax. The bluish gray lines show the distribution of a straight broad based value added tax. And remarkably, it's not regressive. Uh, that's because of some issues in the way they define uh, income, which we can talk about. But, but um, it's a, about proportional. But then the, uh, what do you call those, the coral colored lines uh, show the effects of adding uh, a refundable credit to the VAT, uh, which essentially gives people back the VAT on the first, uh, 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 like, 10000 or $15,000 uh, of their income. And you can see that's a progressive tax shift, those two in, co in combination. And so uh, we shouldn't be scared of the distributional effects of what we might otherwise think of as good taxes for reasons relating to efficiency and saving and uh, administration and environment and stuff like that. So let me just conclude, uh, I think, very much in the vein of things that Ned uh, talked about and cared about and things that I learned about from him. Uh, inequality has increased. That makes policy formulations more difficult politically. Uh, these emphasis on distributional neutrality, revenue neutrality is all status quo based. Uh, and uh, because the underlying baseline has changed, the policy choices defined in terms of distributional neutrality have become more difficult. Uh, second, we want to take that into account in terms of generating po solutions that are both fair and politically workable. Uh, uh, it, it, nothing is going to stay in, in place if it's not broadly considered to be fair and, and uh, you know, consistent with, with uh, broad-based public goals. I just completed writing a, a chapter for this, this aforementioned book on fiscal history. In, in the U.S., and one of the really interesting things to think about is which parts of the system stick and which parts of the system don't. And it turns out that a lot of the things that people really want to change, like getting rid of the income tax, getting rid of tax expenditures, massively forming Social Security and Medicare, those are the things that have been with us for very, very long times. And uh, the things that don't tend to last long are, are low tax rates uh, or, or uh, uh, broad basis. So, so uh, we need to take account of inequality if for no other reason than people's notions of what's fair and what's politically viable depend dramatically on the current distribution of resources. Uh, so we should, last point, we should take it account, but we shouldn't be afraid of it. There are ways of dealing with this stuff that should not, uh, should not constrain us uh, to, you know, nth best policy. Maybe we can move up to n minus one best policy. Anyway, thank you very much. Thank you, Bill. And you actually did cover them all in the allotted 15 minutes. Um, our final speaker in this session is Jean Sterling, uh, now of the Urban Institute but who's had a distinguished and varied career both in government and the nonprofit sector. And he is going to talk, I believe, about uh, some thoughts in a book he has just published called Dead Men Ruling, which I guess is a kind of paraphrase of John Maynard Keynes' famous remark about the hand of some scrivener of the past. Um, in other words, the fact that, despite the fact that we are a very rich country, uh, legislators of the past from both parties have so tied our um, budgetary hands with per permanent entitlements that there is zero leeway for um, new discretionary spending. Does that pretty much sum it up? Yeah. Uh.
Thank you, Marina. And it's an honor to be on a panel with you and uh, Sheldon Bilt, uh, three people who I very much admire. And of course, we're all here because we all especially admire uh, Ned Gramlich. And uh, I was thinking of him today as I came to the conference because I actually went to the office a little early to make a last minute adjustment to a slide. And I was walking down 21st Street. And those of you who live in Washington know that Ned often walked from his home on Connecticut Avenue and actually would often come by 21st Street and walk right down here. It's about a two mile, mile to work. And I, so I kept thinking of him as I, as I came down here. We also had a chance to work together over time. At the time of his death, he was actually working at both Michigan and the Urban Institute putting out books on the subprime mortgage before the uh, actual uh, full impact of the Great Recession uh, uh, had hit. And earlier, we had written a book together called uh, The uh, Government We Deserve uh, with two other co-authors, which actually dealt with some of the same issues today, income distribution and fiscal policy uh, and so on. In fact, I've still used that title, The Government We Deserve, for a column I do today. So it's an honor to, as I say, to be here with everyone else to honor him. I should mention also, uh, just as a matter of how housekeeping. Uh, we did a film, a tribute to Ned Graham. Like several people in the room here actually contributed to that film. Maybe you might raise your hand. I see a bunch of them here. Uh, and uh, that film is now available online. There was a couple things in there that was slightly sensitive early on, but now everybody has given us permission. We just made it available. And maybe Susan, Paul, we could send an email to everybody with, 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 with that film, or we can maybe list it outside at the table, too, so if you, if you want to look at it. There's some great tributes to him uh, by not just the people, as I mentioned, this room, but people like Ben Bernanke uh, and Alan Greenspan. So what do I want to do in, in my brief period of time here? I, I basically want to convince you of two things, although this slide says I've got, got four, but, uh, but the two things are that we live at a time of extraordinary possibility. So uh, I, I don't think this would be a surprise to anybody in this room. Uh, you know, if you take any projection from the Federal Reserve or from the Congressional Budget Office or else, and you project, project out a number of years, we project economic growth. Now, it might be economic growth at a rate we're not happy with. It might be lower than we've had historically, but it doesn't mean we're still not the richest uh, richer than we've ever been in the past, and we're going to get richer in the future. And a large amount of what I wrote about in this book, Dead Men Ruling, is nothing more as let's recapture the ability to allocate that growth in ways that we think uh, is useful. Uh, and that we have extraordinary possibilities before us. And when we talk about this being an age of austerity, it's just wrong. Uh, we, yes, we have constraints, but they're largely self-imposed upon us. They're a straitjacket we wrap around ourselves. And to make it even more complicated, in many cases, if not most, they're a straitjacket we tie around ourselves because of good things happening to us. We live longer. We're getting better health care. Uh, I have this dream that uh, sometimes that I'm sitting in the Ways and Means Committee room uh, and someone from the National Institutes of Health comes in and shouts, Eureka, we found this cure, though expensive, for cancer. And we in the audience are sitting back, you know, feeling pretty good about, you know, the possibility of our longer lives or those of our relatives. And I look behind the podium and the members of Congress are sweating and wiping their brows saying, oh my gosh, what's this going to do to the Social Security and Medicare trust funds? The deficits are <laughs> going to be even worse. And that's, that's really, really uh, what's going on in, 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 in our fiscal situation. Uh, I do want to make a, one very strong point, which is, which is a little more academic. I think diagnosing this problem as that of a deficit is incorrect. The deficit is a symptom of this larger problem. The larger problem is basically the extent to which over decades, this is built up over decades, we have attempted to control the future in ways that's just not possible. A future that cannot possibly be known fully certainly has uncertainties. This attempt to control that future is what's really boxing us in. And when you define it only as the deficit, you're looking only at one, one symptom. It has implications not just for the way we conduct fiscal policy, so we, did, we don't distinguish between, as people in this room know, between short-term and long-term policy, but it has implications for the way we do our, our, our econometric and, and fiscal studies as well. Uh, so as one proof, I've gone to audiences for a number of years on this topic, and I kept trying to prove that the world today is different than the past, because the word deficit says, well, haven't we always had profligate legislatures and, and executives, and aren't they just being profligate again? Is that the problem? The difference between that world, where you're profligate year after year, and the current world is that, that if you want to call it profligacy, is built in. And that's unique in all of our history. So this little graph is nothing more than the extent to which uh, revenues are taken up by what we call mandatory programs or commitments from the past that's already in the law that doesn't require any new appropriation by the Congress. So basically, this is the percent of revenues that are left after you take into account these mandatory, sometimes called entitlement programs and interest on the debt. And as you can see, for the first time in U.S. history, 
In 2009, every dollar of revenue had been committed before Congress even walked in the door. Now this has, as I discuss in, in this book, has enormous uh, economic and political implications, but among the political implications are to do anything with appropriations, Congress has to raise the deficit. To do anything new, they've got to either raise the deficit or renege, and this is crucial, renege on a past promise to, to the public. So say the disease that's before us is that basically these attempts to control the future set in motion a whole series of economic and political problems, only one of which is, is the level of, say, some uh, some some uh, uh, current deficit. And I should say that that attempt to control the future, and I, I go through a long history in the book, comes about both because of the automatic growth, particularly in health and retirement programs, but there's also automatic growth on many of the tax expenditures that Bill talked about, such as the home mortgage interest deduction. Most of us live in housing that's 50 percent, say, larger than, say, our parents lived in, and we automatically got 50 percent higher uh, uh, tax breaks. So it, it extends throughout, throughout, throughout the tax system. We automatically uh, basically have this growing. And of course, uh, we also have, and I go through this long history, the Republicans basically came in uh, around the, uh, uh, about the, around the late 70s, early 80s, and argued for what Jude Wininsky, a Wall Street Journal editorial writer, wrote called the two Santa theory. His, his, his argument was this, is that we Democrat, we Republicans have never won uh, the House of Representatives in 40 years, or we had hadn't won it. I think there was. I think it was 57 or 61 years they didn't have it. The presidency from Franklin Roosevelt to uh, 1968 was held by Democrats except for a short tenure with Dwight Eisenhower and they weren't sure they wanted to count him as a Republican. And he said, you know, that's because they got to be Santa Claus. They got to operate on the giveaway side of the budget. We were always Scrooge. We need to be Santa Claus too. We need to have tax cuts we don't pay for. And so as we move to the modern era, we actually got the two Santas. We had both spending increases that we didn't finance, tax cuts we didn't finance, and that automatic growth in spending on one side and tax cuts we didn't pay for on the other side basically created this, together created this, this situation. As I say, this led to four economic problems, one of which everybody in this room knows, the, the threat of an unsustainable debt. I'm not even going to discuss that because I think it's well understood. What's a little less understood by the public but well understood by this audience is that we have decreased flexibility to respond to new emergencies. That new emergency might be another recession. Look what's going on in Europe. They didn't have the fiscal flexibility to handle their back-to-back -back recession. You might argue they had more flexibility uh, than they thought they had, but at some level they have reduced flexibility, whether you think that's a political constraint or an economic constraint, it's still playing through. We have less flexibility to respond to some new need like autism or Alzheimer's disease. You know, why do our elderly programs, if Alzheimer's is a growing problem, why do we keep devoting more and more of the benefits earlier and earlier in, in our lifetimes relative to expected death, right? The fact we don't adjust for retirement age means a larger and larger percentage of benefits go to us when we're younger, and yet we've got this problem coming on when we're older. Uh, I'd like to argue we have a budget for a declining nation. One example I give, here's the growth in Social Security, Medicare, uh, defense I've assumed some cutback, uh, and interest on the debt. And you can see that anything else basically has to be, uh, has to be paid for uh, out of deficits, and that's crimping basically on those programs we might think of, and there's a debate on how you organize them and design them, but that we might think of as investment programs. Certainly, uh, we've really had a huge impact on children. We've done a study now for six, seven years at the Urban Institute, which we call Kids Share. We examine the percent of the budget that's going to children, and basically, as you move forward towards the future, nothing of economic growth is going to children. So this budget is, if you want to, upside down. It's more and more is financing consumption, and less and less is financing con investment. And, and this doesn't even have to do with the tax issues that Bill talked about them, which add to them because of our design of pension policy, which, by the way, doesn't subsidize savings. It subsidizes deposits, which is one of the reasons it doesn't, doesn't work. So you have a budget ever more financing consumption, which discourages work, particularly among those approaching uh, older ages, uh, producing, if you want to, for the economy, a negative rate of return. And the things we might think might produce a positive rate of return, uh, infrastructure, investment in children, education, is going into a tailspin, which I call a budget for a declining nation. And I don't think, by the way, is built into any of the econometric models. They don't really deal with, with that impact uh, on, on, on growth. And the three political problems, I sort of already mentioned one of them. Basically, we put politicians in a position where to do anything new, they've got to renege on a past promise. So think about uh, the last presidential debate when President Obama and Governor Romney were debating Medicare. So mm -hmm. Governor Romney accuses President Obama of cutting back on Medicare for the elderly, which he did, partly, because that's partly how he paid 
uh, far through a little more price controls. That's how he paid for more health care for the non-elderly. So he did cut back on Medicare for the elderly a little bit because it's unsustainable. Governor Romney, in turn, proposed a voucher system, which would have cut back, if you want to, on uh, Medicare for the elderly. And, and the president accused him of cutting back. And so they, as soon as either one said, I'm going to renege on some unsustainable promise, the other immediately attacked them. Uh, for what they do. And politics plays on, if you want to, identifying winners. It's not a good position to be in to identify losers. And actually, it leads to a classic prisoner's dilemma, which I think the politicians really are in. If they lead, they lose. The Democrats felt that in 93, they did deficit reduction. They exaggerate what they did by themselves, but, but they did some of this. They lost the Congress for the first time. They feel like they financed George W. Bush's tax cuts in 2000. The Republicans, in turn, I believe when they were the fiscal hawks back in the 50s and 60s, they never won, they never won uh, elections. I think there's truth to it. There is, it is a prisoner's dilemma. And as you know, for a prisoner's dilemma, you've got to figure out some way of getting the parties to cooperate up front to be able to, to, be able to solve it. So here's a, just a tiny little bit more proof that the world is different today than the past. Here's the traditional budget scenario that we had for over 200 years of our history. And by the way, the same thing plays out in all the developed nations of the world. So you're running a deficit in the current period, right? But what's happening to revenues? They rise with the economy. I don't care if you have a tariff or an income tax. Revenues rise with the economy. Over a period of 20 or 30 years, you probably have twice as many revenues. In a period of an eight-year presidency, you probably have 30% more revenues by the time the president's in his eighth year than the first year. And what's happens to spending under current law? Not where spending will be in the future. This is what current law requires. Well, discretionary spending would decline. The post office was built. The highway was built. Yes, you probably maintain it, so it doesn't decline necessarily to zero, but discretionary spending under current law declines. And so what do you have in the future? Well, you have these massive surpluses coming. And those of us who are a little bit older in the room, remember we used to pick up our textbooks and read about fiscal drag and how we had to solve fiscal drag. So the politicians, their job is to deal with this fiscal drag, drag and give away money. They've got to have tax cuts or spending increases to, to offset what current law would do by itself. Now move forward to sort of the current scenario where spending is not only built in and automatic, but mainly in the health and retirement programs for reasons I'm not going to go into here. It's actually scheduled to grow ever faster than the economy. Wage indexing, health is a superior good. There's all sorts of reasons why it will grow faster than the economy. So spending is scheduled to grow faster than the economy. Now you're in this situation where if all you do is short run deficit reduction, you never solve the problem. So whether it's the Maastricht Agreement in 93 that says, well, let's try to get deficits to 3% GDP or even what we succeeded in doing in the 90s in the United States, you never get out of the soup if you don't deal with this fundamental issue. You can't promise so much in the future uh, that you're trying to solve the problem. If you want to, deficit reductions is sort of like you, uh, it's like we've got this house and the doors and the windows are, are wide open in the front and the varmints and the creatures are coming in and through deficit reduction we're going to set traps and try to shove them out the back door but we never shut the front door so they keep coming in and that's exactly, that's exactly what we do with trying to solve this problem with short run deficit reduction agreement after deficit reduction agreement. You've got to get at this extent to which we try to control the future. Uh, I've got some slides here I'm not going to go through. You don't solve the problem with economic growth either. Economic growth does raise revenues, but it turns out these programs are also scheduled to grow faster when the economy grows faster. So it doesn't get you out of the problem. Uh, in terms of the macro econ economy, it's actually interesting to think about what our fiscal history says. So there's this, 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 it's a little more of the popular history, but the, this, both the Keynes and the supply setters keep looking back to periods like the 60s. And they talk about how these tax cuts actually eventually paid for themselves. They both made the argument for, for, for different reasons. One was demand side and one was supply side. If you think about it, if they were wrong, it didn't matter. Because given my earlier slides, if they were wrong, we went back into balance in four years. If they were right, we went back into balance in three years. That's a very different world than if you're running a macro study and you say, well, I can project from the past what some tax cut did to what some tax cut's going to do in the future because you've got to build into that model what these automatic programs, these automatic programs are doing. So just to give you an idea of, of the extent to which commitments from the past are dominating us, this is sort of a projection taking some CBO and other figures on what current law requires. About 10 years from now, we'll have another trillion dollars uh, of revenues to spend. That's not by the way, uh, an issue of austerity. You know, another trillion dollars is basically about, this is just the federal spending, by the way. This doesn't include tax subsidies, which also will grow. It doesn't include state and local spending. That's about $8,000 a household or something like that that we'll have more in about 10 years to spend. Uh, but guess what? We've already decided how to spend it. We're going to have, you know, $500 billion more in health care. 
uh, about 400 billion more in, in Social Security, another 500 billion in net interest on the debt. So we already have sort of overspent it. And again, squeezing everything else, including those things we might think of as investment in the future. So I've got a bunch of, uh, of other issues here with respect to just how this plays out. Uh, for instance, this commitment, I get back to this question of whether we're promoting investment or promoting consumption, you know, this commitment to ever more money for elderly programs, we often look at it on the spending side, but if you look at Congressional Budget Office or our Fed Reserve or anybody else's other projections on what's happened to the labor force, we're also doing it in a way where we're adding to this pressure, downward pressure on the labor force which also affects GDP, personal income, income tax collections. The biggest effect of the early retirement age in a study we did, by the way, wasn't on Social Security, it was on income tax collections, if you're worried about what it does to the federal policy. Uh, here's just a little connection with the discussion on income distribution, and this is partly federal-led, it's not entirely our led, is if you look at income growth for a 20-year period from 1990 to 2010, and you ask what happened to per capita income, 33% of all income growth basically went in the form of health care. So when we do a lot of these distributional studies, we don't take into account the extent to which that health care is added or not added into the measure of the income uh, of individuals. That's 33% on average. For lower and modern income workers, it's probably even more. It's probably over 50% of their income growth comes in the form of, of health benefits, benefits we, we provide. Uh, I'm going to go on and try to end here on, 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 on a positive note. So this, this is, again, uh, uh, I know this times often sounds what I go on to is, is a negative lesson, but basically I didn't want to convince you this is a straight jacket we tie around ourselves. So here's just some numbers projected in the future. Let's hope that they come true. These are basically, again, CBO projections. About 10 years from now, they say that uh, basically GDP will probably grow by about $27,000. Uh, per household. These are numbers per household, not for the economy as a whole. Direct spending would grow by about uh, $9,000, uh, mainly because uh, of discretionary spending growing uh, uh, quite, quite substantially. Tax expenditures would grow by another 3000 So whether you're counting growth in GDP or growth in the spending that we uh, are going to do or can do, uh, and by the way, that's true whether you're under a Republican agenda or a Democratic agenda, economic growth is probably going to make possible a much higher level of spending. And so the real question, just the real question before us, is how do we, again, regain control of our future? How do we allocate these monies? I'm not even talking about cutting back on what we do now, but how do we allocate that, reallocate that growth so that we can put it more towards what we hope would be more of an investment agenda? And in my view, we should start making, thinking about things like making the 21st century a century for children the same way we made the 20th century a century for improving uh, programs for the elderly. I think it's entirely possible if we set our minds uh, to do it. You know, there, uh, Antoine de uh, Exupéry, who uh, wrote uh, something called The Little Prince, once uh, said that our job uh, is, not to, uh, is not to control the future, but to enable it. And I think that's the task we have at hand. Thank you. Thank you very much, Eugene, and thank you particularly for ending on this optimistic note. Uh, I can't help taking away, the, in business schools they're always asking about what is the takeaway, uh, from all three of you, despite the fact that two of you, I think, might deny it, uh, that in a way you all do share Ned's optimism. In, the following sense, and I will simply give you two quotes. One is from Shakespeare's Julius Caesar, uh, the fault, dear Brutus, is not on our stars, but in ourselves. And the other one coming from, uh, is it Pogo? Uh, we have met the enemy and he is us. So, um, and it seems to me, you know, if it's us, by golly, we ought to be able to fix it. Um, before we go on to questions from the audience, let me ask the speakers if there's anything any or all of them would like to say in response to their fellow speakers. I'm even more depressed than when I started because um, Bill, if, if um, <laughs> 
there's general agreement that tax reform should be distributionally neutral, and we're at this all-time high in income and wealth inequality. And the same thing with, with uh, mm -hmm. your point. I mean, I, I don't see how you get any change in growth in income for the bottom 40 percent unless you have progressive taxation. So um, obviously, uh, I, I, I would think, I, I'm not going to go to the Paquetti and Saez 70 percent marginal tax rates, but another 10 percent on the top tax rate now, I don't see how you reduce poverty and inequality unless you do that. Anybody else? Uh, I was going to make a totally different point, which is the, the reason I put up the CBO market income relative to Piketty Saez was the CBO market income includes health insurance. Uh, I realized I forgot to mention that when Gene emphasized how important health insurance is. Uh, but the main, the main difference between Piketty Saez and CBO is that CBO uh, in their market income measure adds in uh, uh, a variety of non- uh, non-cash forms of compensation, the most prominent one of which is, is health care, but also retirement contributions and stuff like that. But there's also increasing inequality, I think, in death rates. Uh, Jim House at Michigan has a book coming out on that. So I think when you attribute the average spending, um, they're, they're not doing distributional analyses in that. So yes, health insurance has increased dramatically, but I think inequality and access to health insurance or the benefits of uh, the increased spending has also become more unequal over this period. So, so, so I'm, I'm not opposed to your agenda. My problem is the top tax rate, which generally is only applied to 1 or 2% of the population, doesn't really give us all that much money to, to solve some of these fundamental problems at the bottom. And I'd suggest that, that another direction and he's written on this as well, but another direction that we really need to go is trying to think about how we refocus our social welfare programs. So the very fact that they're so oriented towards consumption these days means that they do, ha we can argue about how large it is, but they do have a negative impact upon work and they have a negative impact on market incomes. That's particularly true for the elderly and near elderly. Uh, so people now today retire for about 11 years more than they did uh, in 1940 when the program was first created. That's about, I think it's about seven years of, six, seven years of, of living longer and about three or four years of, of retiring earlier, even in nominal age. Uh, those six or seven extra years of, of living longer, by the way, mainly benefit you and me. So it, uh, if we're couples, you know, we might be getting, say, 50,000 of Social Security benefits a year. We're getting $300,000 of extra Social Security benefits a year. And the argument is, well, we need to do that because we care about the guy who might die at 62 or 63, and we're going to get him 20000 So we totally reallocate allocate the money, spend huge amounts in ways that encourage us to retire early. And, and actually, among lower-income people, discourage work. Uh, in fact, the income distribution of the elder is getting worse because the higher income are now working longer and the lower income aren't. And so by the time they're 70, what might be a two to one ratio becomes a four to one ratio. Uh, so uh, to me, the, and you, again, I say you've written on it, is, is moving that social welfare agenda, not because I'm opposed to the consumption agenda, or I don't think it didn't succeed in doing tremendous things in reducing poverty. We can argue about how well allocated it is. But I think roaring it back towards an investment agenda, back towards education, things like training that you've talked a lot about, you know, uh, apprenticeships, on and on. If we start taking some of that growth and allocating it there, to me, that's as crucial and maybe provides even more money than even just, say, ta taxing the rich to try to, try to, do, to do some of, the, some of the same things you want to do. Let, let me ask one question, and then we'll start in. Um, and that is uh, one of the things that's come out of these discussions is that the ideological differences between Democrat, stylized Democrats and stylized Republicans is not absolutely crucial to what happens. Therefore, leaving aside these, the, the, the current ideological standoff, uh, how would you reach into this Gordian knot and which string would you pull first to try to uh, move things back to a better world? 
which all of you say we are capable of doing. I mean, capable in, a, in the sense of our resources broadly construed. Well, I'm reminded of Ned's uh, Social Security Task Force where um, Ned proposed a reasonable series of small um, benefit cuts and small tax increases to be implemented over a long period of time. And as I recall, there were five votes for, uh, five votes on the left that were against it because it was uh, going to uh, uh, cut benefits and five votes against it because it was going to raise taxes and Ned and maybe he got one other vote uh, but I think that was the early indication of what went wrong the Greenspan Commission on Social Security was in 83 and I think Ned came along a dozen years later and thought okay we can do the same thing and that I think is the early indicator of what went wrong I think for Jean's issues presumably I haven't gone back and looked at it but I suspect if we go back to that Social Security reform you would say okay that would help with this unsustainable increase um, uh, in spending on the elderly that you know uh, that you know Ned talked about all these issues all the time if, if uh, either of you has a response quick because we need to give the audience sometime. Yeah, I was just going to say, I, I agree. I mean, I, I didn't get to the slides, but, uh, and this is perfectly in line with what Ned was saying. I'm, I'm, the big compromise that I talk about is, is, and it's hard politically, but economically it makes sense, is the Democrats need to give up on the automatic growth in the spending. doesn't mean you don't have the growth, but you need to decide it on a, on a level playing field so education can compete with health and retirement. Uh, the Republicans need to give up on the automatic growth in tax subsidies, and they have to agree to pay our bills as we go along. Having a tax cut you don't pay for is just shifting a tax to future generations. And that type of compromise, it seems to me, gives us the flexibility to do a lot of the things that I think all of us at this table would like to do. I'll just add one quick thing. I don't think we can get where we need to go without added revenues. And uh, uh, and that's why I talked about the carbon tax and the VAT. Uh, I don't think we're going to get that much more income, revenue out of the income or the corporate tax. Uh, but, but, I mean, I'm not saying just tax the hell out of everything and then we can spend it on whatever we want. I am saying that a solution... Uh, uh, under current revenue restrictions, uh, it's going to be very difficult to achieve. Um, basically, Gene has presented a very eloquent case for why we should massively cut Social Security and Medicare benefits, and that's just not going to happen. And so uh, the idea, is, to me, is generating revenues uh, in a way that is uh, fair and uh, efficient and then using it to fund government spending that is fair and efficient. There was a question I know in the back. an economist, Vina Trahan. I'm not an economist. I'm a policy writer and activist. So I wanted to say a few different things. Um, first of all, you know, there's the Oxfam study that said, I think it was 85 people, but as, num uh, as many people as would fit on a double-decker bus essentially have as much wealth as three and a half billion people on this planet. And so I think for a lot of us, when we look at things like Walmart's um, the six areas of Walmart have basically as much money as the GDP of Bangladesh or 42% of the country. It's very difficult morally to see a case where we don't have highly progressive taxation on income and wealth and um, obviously what's happening in terms of hedge funds um, and private equity is just, I, I think, purely morally indefensible. Excuse me, but is there Sorry. a question in there? Yes. Okay, thank you very much. So that's one question, and this is not an economic question. This is a question dealing with the morality, but to be really honest, I think that needs to be part of it. Number two, and you can defer this if you'd like, but my number two question was, um, is, it part of, um, is it part of what we should consider the whole sort of discussion of reparations in the sense that there's institutionalized predatory practices occurring against people. So even if we give the poor more money, you know, if that's taken away from them in terms of foreclosures, in terms of so many other things, it doesn't matter. And then my final point would be um, 
Where's my final point? Give if you don't second. mind, I'm going to go on while you think yeah, about actually, it. Yeah, actually, I kind of do mind, and <laughs> I just do want to say one more thing. If and it's a question. Yes, exactly. It is a question. I, I recently gave a talk on the garment industry, but my third point would be, I think for many of us, the lack of transparency in the current globalized system is a problem. So, for example, when my daughter buys a T-shirt, she's often buying a T-shirt made from essentially cotton that was produced under slave labor. So if we do not have true visibility into um, how things are produced and what the external costs are in terms of carbon costs, et cetera, can we truly reform the system or what, what's the role for that? I'm going to, uh, since we are very short of time, I'm going to ask if there are other questions and then ask our, our speakers to respond to collectively to whatever um, they're asked. Hi, Vic Miller, uh, working economist, now retired. Uh, the question is, you've been talking about the changes in income and wealth distribution in the country over time in uh, terms of revenues and uh, expenditures of government. Uh, how much of that is also should we discuss in terms of monetary policy, banking policy, the, uh, the, the changes in wealth that have, that have accrued in the, in the stock market and such uh, that have very little, to some extent some, very, relative, relatively little to do with the government expenditures and revenues you're talking about? I find it hard to see. so. Um Okay, if there are no more questions, unless I've missed somebody's hand somewhere, uh, and why don't we go in the same order that people spoke? Um, Sheldon? Well, to be brief, certainly the issue about private equity, carried interest is certainly something that I think nobody on this panel would say should be uh, anything other than taxed at ordinary income. I don't know how much revenue that raises, but I think both of the points were made. There have been lots of changes in labor market regulations, banking regulations, tax uh, policies, et cetera, I think that have all contributed to rising income and wealth inequality after taxes and transfers. Uh, uh Okay, uh, I want to focus on the uh, morality question, and I thank you for raising the issue. Uh, I, I uh, share what I gather are your concerns about uh, the distribution of income, the poverty of, of, of a large chunk of the world's population. Uh, but there's a difference between sharing that concern and being convinced that you know high punitive tax rates are the right answer. I mean, ask yourself, would all these people be better off if Walmart had never existed? And uh, uh, I think the answer is no. I think Walmart makes a heck of a lot of money because it provides a heck of a lot of valuable services to a heck of a lot of people. And if we feel, if, if there's some way in which they abused the system or committed criminal acts or, you know, did something that was not, you know, uh, uh, legally appropriate, then sure, they should be penalized for it. But I, I don't get, I n have never understood uh, in the absence of something like that, the notion of blaming the failure of some or the lack of progress that some, uh, you know, fail to experience on the success of others. And uh, so that's one point, the mor morality point. The other is just the sheer efficacy of really high tax rates. I mean, Piketty uh, almost as an afterthought or a logical implication of what he's saying, it seems, proposed a global wealth tax. Uh, I don't get the sense that his, his heart is really in that. And I don't know any uh, economist or anyone who's thought uh, seriously about how a global wealth tax would work whose heart is really in a global wealth tax. And so, so even if we want to shift the distribution of burdens in a more progressive manner, which I would not be opposed to, we've got to think real carefully about what actually works. And uh, uh, I don't think, especially in uh, today's society where money can be moved around so easily, 
uh, that that it's so obvious that we should just boost rates to the you know seventy percent rate that that is sometimes uh, talked about. I think I, even if we share the goal that you're discussing and. Uh, even if we think the distribution should be shifted, there's a there's a real question about how you actually do that, and and it's not obvious. Gene, the final word. So I, I have testified on increasing taxes on private equity owners, and and uh, and very much have favored that. Uh, I've also at times you know favored higher tax rates. Again, I just want to point out, just taxing the super rich at a higher rate just doesn't necessarily raise that much revenues. Most of revenues of government are are paid for by the middle class, and most of the benefits received by the middle class and if, if we can't address that issue you know if, we, if the left we only attack the, the really wealthy and the right we only attack welfare recipients you're just never going to get at these problems and on the wealth issue and I'm going to try to tie these together too there's, there's a couple other things we, we actually have to worry about it's not just the question of what's happened to the wealthy uh, where we want to change policies and there and I don't know the answer here but I think we need a, a modern form of antitrust policy too that it's not just a question of trying to tax our way out of out of what's going on in, in this, these broader economic problems. But there's also the issue of how we increase the wealth of, of, of the non-wealthy, because there's two things going on. It's not just the wealthier getting wealthier, but even as we get richer as a society, uh, the non-wealthy have, in many cases, uh, not been saving very much. They have very inadequate money in their retirement accounts. Uh, we've also done this thing related to this question, partly monetary policy, but probably more regulatory policy. We've, we've gotten a number, we've gotten some younger generations and some particularly people of color in this situation where we really encouraged them to buy housing when the market was bubbling up and then when the market was the, was fell up ra quite rapidly, we sort of cut them out of the market. And now that the market's sort of a little bit back in a bubble, at least by the Federal Reserve numbers I look at, wealth to income ratios, now we're saying, well, maybe we'll let you back in. So so for the, for the low income people, we've got them in this buy high, sell low uh, type of policy. So there are a lot of things I think we have to work on if we care about these income and wealth distributions, and they go beyond just the question of, 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 of taxing the wealthy. And it would go to what we want to do with, with uh, I think, with monetary and, and regulatory policy and antitrust policy as well. We should thank our speakers, and I leave to Paul and Dan so to solve the problem of the fact that we have eaten up the break. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so we will just uh, eat into our lunch a little and push everything back 10 minutes. Thanks.